Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. All of us at Should Have Listened to My Mother love getting your feedback and responses, especially to specific episodes that have struck a personal chord for one reason or another. If you'd like to reach us directly to share your story, you can email us at shltmm podcast at gmail.com. And please give us a five-star rating next time you listen, and thanks, as always. Lots of powerful emotions and messages come to mind when thinking of my guest, Gina Mundy. Firstly, her message is coming from her heart. Secondly, as a mother of three, she's frustrated because she knows things could have been avoided. And thirdly, as an attorney and having spent decades litigating and scrutinizing procedures, she can clearly see that there wasn't proper care of mother and or baby in the delivery room. It brings to mind the Boy Scout motto, be prepared, which she would like you to bring into the delivery room the next time you're headed there. Gina's number one best-selling book, A Parent's Guide to a Safer Childbirth, Expecting the Best, Using the Power of Knowledge to Help You Deliver a Healthy Baby. It's a godsend to so many. Gina Mundy is a childbirth attorney who spent countless hours meticulously reviewing childbirth cases, particularly medical malpractice defense, and she specializes in birth trauma, obstetrics, gynecology litigation. She says, she says, now you can help ensure both you and your baby experience a safer, healthier, and less complicated childbirth. Hi, Gina. Welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Hi, Jackie. I'm very excited to be here, and thank you for the beautiful introduction. Well, thank you for bringing this awareness to not only moms, moms and dads, and families, because it's really important, and you have more experience than anyone I know in having to go through this grueling experience, emotional experience, not only for you as an attorney, but the poor families that have had complications in the delivery room. But before we get into your book and what you're here to help us with, what kind of role did your mom play in you? How did you jump into law and why this topic specifically? So my mom has always just been a huge supporter of me and no matter you know what I wanted to do, but I knew early on I was going to be an attorney. I had no idea I was going to be an attorney specializing in childbirth cases until I got my first job out of law school. So this area of medicine, specifically as it relates to childbirth cases, it's, I had no idea this even existed. Um, it's not something I learned about you know, in high school, college, law school. So basically I stumbled on my first job and which was really i was hired in as part of a team of over 20 of us and that's all we did were these childbirth cases and as you indicated i mean these are cases really where something goes wrong or a complication so you know babies are not born healthy or moms sometimes don't make it through childbirth so since i was um i had just gotten married and having a baby was on my radar Oh, uh, boy, I, I bet it was, huh? Yeah, well, I just out of law school. So I wanted to make sure that uh, what was happening to these families didn't happen to mine. So that was, and then I, 21 years later, I'm still practicing um, this area. And then six months ago, published a book to, you know, expecting parents or whatnot. But yeah, my mom was, has been a huge supporter, even when I was writing my book. You know, I writing a book was never on my radar until I knew I had the knowledge to help people. So I would send portions of my book and chapters of my book as I was writing it to my mom. And she would go through and she would read it and you know, she would she'd pick out kind of the funniest things, you know, but she'd be like, <laughs> I don't really understand what this is. You know, and I'd be like, Okay, well if you don't understand and you've had three kids, uh, then uh, you know, I'm like, I better redo it. So yeah, she was a huge part. She's always been a huge supporter, no matter what I, what I've wanted to do or decisions I've made. My mom's always been right there cheering me on. Where did you grow up? Brighton, Michigan. Okay. And do you have siblings? 
I do. I have two sisters. So there's yeah, three girls my mom had, and it was cool because my mom had two sisters. And so when those three are together, my mom and my two aunts, oh my goodness, do they have fun? <laughs> well, I was just telling this past weekend, I was with my two sisters and I was just smiling because you know what? We, it's like we learned how to have fun by watching them. Yeah. And boy, did we, did we have a great weekend together. Where are you in the order of the three? Oldest. Oh, okay. So did, is your mom, and I often ask my guests, you being the first child, did your mom kind of raise you differently than, than the next down the line? Was she a little tougher on you, as some parents tend to be on their firstborn, or love it first sight and forever after? <laughs> uh, 100% <laughs> tougher on me uh. <laughs> all day long. But you know, it made, they pushed me um, to do my best. I remember she would go to my parent teacher conferences in high school and she'd come back and she would just be like, you know, your teacher said that if you actually put like some little bit more effort into it, you know, you, you could be like an outstanding student, not just a good student, you know, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a high schooler at that point. Again, this is the early nineties, by the way. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I was definitely, especially when you compare me to my youngest sister, yeah, there was high expectations all, all the way. And were you, once the other girls came around, were you kind of mom's helper, or was Phyllis in a little bit about, was your mom home with you, or did she work when you were growing up? So my mom worked full-time, and then so did my dad. So they were gone a lot and they were, my mom was a very eight to five, nine to five job. So she did not get out of work or leave the office until five, which then meant rush hour. So yeah, there were many, many times where it was basically go in the canned foods and pick out whether you want ravioli, (laughs) lasagna, or SpaghettiOs. Great, great options. What did your mom do? Uh, My mom was vice president of a company called Champion Screen Machine Engineering for many, many years. And and just out of curiosity, what what industry are they in? Yeah, that's funny. You know, I didn't <laughs> go into it, so I'm not quite sure, but it had something to do with screw machine, screw machine parts. Oh, well, that's <laughs> industry. Uh, you know, that's manufacturing. Yeah, that's, yes. Great. That, that sounds about right. Is she uh, mechanically inclined herself? Like, was she building things? Was she handy? Or is she no. handy? Not at all. No, not not at all. <laughs> no, she's more. She was part of the brains behind the operation. Excellent. Just running the company. Mm-hmm. So then it was up to you to kind of. Were you guys latchkey kids? You'd come home on your own and with you know in and out of the door from school and have to do your homework by the time they were home supposedly. Oh yeah, homework. We had our daily chores, and those had to be done before mom and dad got home from work. So, yep. And then we had to be, if we had any sports, to be ready for them or whatnot. So, What do you remember? What kind of chores you had to do? Did you, did you have a specific chore that you were responsible for? Oh, we had a list. So we would all rotate. It was vacuuming, dishes, and kitchen. Excellent. So usually, <laughs> yeah, the two old, my, you know, my younger sister is only 16 months younger than me. So she was right there doing them, um, you know, with me. And then April came a little bit later. I think she's six years younger than me. And so she, you know, she'd get the light duty stuff. Right. So, so when our mom would be out, um, she was home with us. Then when we got a little bit older, she would start taking classes and things. But we were always watching TV when we shouldn't have been because, you know, she referred to the TV as the idiot box. Um, so we would see her pulling in the driveway and we ducked down below the windows. Oh, my God, we're terrible. But you know what? That's as long as you got your chores done before they got home, right? It was up to you three to figure it out. Absolutely. That's funny. Yeah, we they would pull in and the TV would go, go. off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. 
also funny what we think we got away with. Uh, you mentioned earlier before the interview started that your mom's name was Susan or Sue. Did your mom or does your mom have a temper? Not at all. She never yelled at all. So it was my dad had the temper. So if you're good, yeah, if you're good cop, bad cop, she was the good cop. He was the bad cop. Mm -mm. Like for grades and things, you'd have to speak to your father? Oh, yeah. She would just defer to him. Oh, how, so. how, how easy that makes everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was your mom uh, mastered in the kitchen, or was she just so busy that it was go to the pantry and pull something out? Oh, definitely go to the pantry. But as we got... As I got older, I'm more into, you know, college years and what law school. We, our dinner turned into like cheese and crackers. And then we put a little bit of, you know, sour cream and then olives on them. And then have, you know, split a bottle of wine. So <laughs> I like <it> that. Did, <laughs> culinary skill <laughs> did improve over time. We went from canned food to cheese and crackers. Well, as long so, as there's yeah. some calories, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something to absorb the red wine. And did your mom ever um, have hobbies of her own? Something that she could just go off and do where you'd hear her humming away or, you know, where you knew she was happy? Guitar. She played the guitar for our church for as, as far as I can remember. She was the Sunday school teacher. So she really enjoyed, uh, and even to this day, she loves being part of you know congregation and church. But yeah, she we did the she did the contemporary service at church. So she had her little band, and they would go practice. I believe was it Wednesday nights, and then they had um, service on Sunday, and then depending on what it was, she would could even then do some. Sunday school teaching, but yeah, playing the guitar. And then she would bring the guitar into school when we were in elementary school and sing and play songs for, you know, classrooms, stuff like that. So yeah, the guitar for sure. Pretty involved with you guys. And then yes, all whenever she wasn't working. Yeah, we're definitely, it went work, kids. And sports, was she out there screaming on the sidelines or was she more subtle? Definitely more subtle. Yes. Well, you know, I can I can kind of compare her to me with my kids. So I'm on the sidelines, you know, screaming and jumping up and down. So if I think of me and then I think of her, I would describe her as subtle. <laughs> that leads me to my next question, which is what tips or ideals have you taken from your mom regarding how you're raising your own children? Being kind and watching how she was so kind to others always just made me smile. And then not only that, if you ever talk to my mom, I mean, we've, I've waited for years. I can't, she doesn't talk bad about people, no matter what. She always looks at the positive. She's a very non-judgmental people. I and mean, I've listened to people tell her crazy things. And she's like, oh, that's nice. You know, she's just very <laughs> non-judgmental, and then she never says anything bad about anybody. I it was about six months ago. She was trying to tell me a story about my grandpa, and you know, he's uh, he's literally turning ninety-six, and she she was frustrated about something. I think it was his car and taking his car away or something, and you know, he doesn't he wants to be independent still and whatnot. And I'm like, oh, here she goes. She's gonna say something bad, and she goes. I'm just so disappointed. And oh like, my gosh. It. That's it, mom. Like, <laughs> but you know, I just feel like in today's world, or maybe it's always been like this, you know, I'll talk to somebody, you know, and the easiest thing that you can do is talk behind someone's back. She's always told me that if you can't say it to their face, don't say it. And mm. I just always took that with me. Yeah. So you know, obviously, I get my heated moments or whatnot, but even when she has her heated moments, she doesn't talk bad about people. And I want you to pay attention, and maybe you know people like that, but I seem to, if I'm talking to somebody sometimes, you know, like people like to throw in a little dirt or sure. you know, whatever, but my mom has never done that. Wow, that's a great one. I think I'm going to write that down. <laughs> never talk <laughs> about anyone. It's a wonderful motto and so easy to do. You just don't do it, right? Literally. Don't get you... into the dirt and the muddle and the mess. 
Right. And, you know, sometimes those can stir up, you know, negative feelings or whatnot. But my mom is by far one of the most positive people I've ever met. But then when you watch the way she conducts herself, it makes complete sense. Even better, right? Yes. So definitely. where did she learn that from? What do your maternal grandmother, is she still with us? No, she passed away. I gave her eulogy on my 40th birthday. I just turned 48 last weekend, which means we had to see, we had right. where birthdays were day off. So yeah, she just passed, she passed away eight years ago then. And are and, your mom and she similar in disposition? Yes, very similar. My grandma, that's interesting you say that, because I was very, very close to my grandma to the point where they asked me to do her eulogy. And I had to write her eulogy. Um, I, wish, I think I wrote it on my 40th birthday and then I gave it on her birthday, which was the following day. Um, but her same way, I loved her and we were we were close because she was so, she loved being around her kids so she, or her grandkids. So when we would go visit her, if we were there, it didn't matter what was going on in her life, she stopped everything and she just was so happy and enjoyed us and she loved to cook for us and do, you know, all the all the fun things. So, yeah, she's, my mom and my grandma are very, very similar people. Are you named after your grandmother? I am not. Okay, sorry, I brought it up. No. <laughs> I am not. My sister, my sister got that name. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. You knew her longer <laughs> than your sister. Exactly. This is pretty magical. And in the photo that you sent me, you can tell that you guys have have similarities, not only physically, but in your smile and in your eyes. So it's really kind of nice to put a little bit of a backstory to to all of it and, and your experience growing up, because it's so nice when you have that beginning, and then you can expose your children to it as well. Yes, definitely. So now you're ready to start your career. You get into this line of work, let alone law, which is very impressive, and then you start diving into this topic of medical malpractice, and you specialize in, in birth trauma. Um, was it did, was the first case that you were on before you had your first baby? It was. It was February two thousand and three. It was my very first case, and then my daughter was born 4404, so April 4th, 2004. And by the time you went in for your second baby, had you changed your own practices of how you went into a delivery room or how you even chose your doctor? Because that's part of your message as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> You're good. Very interesting. Uh, yes, I did get a more conservative doctor, low risk because of how you know how much i had learned and then as attorneys doing what we do we because we can't unsee what we've seen unknow what we know it's very hard for us to relax during childbirth so i had an elective c-section with my second now i did have a c-section with my first my first daughter However, you know, there is the VBAC or vaginal birth after C-section option, but with, given what I do, I just went straight elective C-section 39 weeks. And for your third child as well? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned you you switched doctors because his, um, what was the word? I don't want to put words in your mouth. He was less ri less no risk. risk. Low risk. low risk. So you can actually ask them for their statistics for that a particular doctor of what their risk? Oh, no. no. So because I, <laughs> I represent the OBGYNs, I just know who's more conservative in their approaches, who's not, who's going to take maybe more risk or whatnot. So there's different doctors practice very differently. And that is very apparent in my cases. I mean, if you're kind of it, you're not in my world. It's hard to, you know, understand. But different doctors, different way, they, different ways they practice. So I knew that my doctor was a very just conservative doctor. He didn't like to take risks. He, when I said elective C-section at 39 weeks, he said, "Great." He goes, "That's fine, Gina. Whatever you want." 
And then especially when managing my pregnancy, because I did have a high stress job. So I did have, you know, the contractions, the stress and, you know, whatnot. So then he'd be like, okay, we're going to have to, you know, take you off work for a little bit towards the end. This is too much for you. Stuff like that. Right. So, but for, so this was your decision to do the the cesarean the second time and third time around. Everyone else has to make that decision on their own. And again, their choice of their doctor, that's basically how it begins. Now, there there's some other guidelines that you want prospective parents to be aware of other than the choice of their doctor and checking for low risk and all that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. There's there's certain yeah. words and a dialect that, that they speak in the delivery room when things start to happen. Oh, 100%. You know, chapter one of my book goes over the lessons from the baby cases And it's for parents to learn these lessons in order to help prevent these mistakes from happening during the birth of their baby. And definitely the number one lesson is to have an understanding of childbirth, understand what you're walking into. You know, we're all guilty of this mindset that bad things only happen to other people and can leave you in a very vulnerable state of mind or vulnerable place. And I don't recommend that on one of the biggest days of your life. For, you know, for the moms out there, if you're anything like me, I played with the baby dolls when I was a kid and I dreamed of that day I was going to have my first baby and look at my baby and hold my baby. So, I mean, it is a day you dream of most of your life. So it's important that you are ready and ready to, um, you know, hold your baby in the end and, and whatnot. But I go through in chapter one, all of the lessons And then each lesson then is a subsequent chapter on how to make sure you have a healthy baby. So when I say lesson one, learn about labor and delivery, prepare for childbirth, chapter two then goes through, all right, this is what you need to know in order to make those good decisions that will help bring your baby into this world healthy because the families and the cases are oftentimes one decision or minutes from a healthy baby. So making good decisions is so incredibly important. But another lesson that is important, and again, this is not stuff you're going to find in a normal pregnancy book, but another big lesson is in my childbirth cases, when something does go wrong like this, there are oftentimes reoccurring facts, reoccurring issues, meaning in the bulk of my cases, these things exist. So chapter 11 goes over the top 10. So, you know, you may have a, like, number one is Pitocin. Pitocin is used to induce mom's labor. That is in the most of my baby cases. Same thing with the busy labor and delivery unit. So I go over, if this happens during your labor, this is what you need to know to make sure, again, to give you a heightened sense of awareness so you know this is this is an important decision time, you know, tips and what to ask and just different different ways to if these things come up you know you can get through it have your healthy baby and whatnot because in overall my book is not about what can go wrong but how it's making sure it goes right and it's important because all of this i can imagine someone who's getting ready to have a baby they're they're all they're anxiety levels are going up. It's like, oh my God, I don't know this. I don't know that. I don't, no one ever told me any of this stuff before. You have an extreme perspective of all this because of all this 20 years of doing these research in these cases, correct? But it okay. doesn't mean that awareness shouldn't be part of the equation for a family. Absolutely. Here's the deal. Based upon what I've seen, when my daughters go into or I should say when my daughters become pregnant or my son's wife becomes pregnant, you know, how I prepare them for childbirth is completely different than how a family would traditionally prepare for childbirth based upon what I've seen. So I started to write this book for my kids. And once I started really writing this, I'm like, this is information that will help every family have a healthy baby. And it kind of just grew, you know, grew from there. And that's what this is. This is a tool to be educated in my mind. I had two two pregnancies, two births. They were home births with a midwife that I trust, an OBGYN I trust 
till the nth degree. My, some of my sisters had their babies with her as well. And we had no complications whatsoever. But everyone has to make that choice for themselves. And again, this is a tool. This book is fantastic to just so you, you can go in with peace of mind. Oh, absolutely. And here's the deal. Husbands, you know, dads want to protect their wife. They want to protect their baby. And literally my book will guide them on exactly how to do that to make sure at the end of the day, they're taking wife and baby home to, I'm sure, the nursery they've worked so hard to get ready <laughs> and the crib they put together and everything else. So, <laughs> that you crib. know, dads are, dads, if you go to my Amazon reviews, dads are like, thank you. It's like the first book where dads have like this path where like they will know how to protect their wife. They will understand how to protect their baby and take them home safely. That's absolutely brilliant because they're always like, well, what do I do? What can I do for you? How can I help you? Do you need anything? Can I rub your back? But this is something like it's a nice tool for them to have and hold in their hands and, and then have their brain active. So hopefully they don't pass out. <laughs> 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 but this is right. also, and, I, and I'm laughing now, but this is a, a, a serious conversation. And, and it's also not only for the safety of the baby, but obviously the safety of the moms, because you have had some cases where the mom didn't make it. And we definitely do not want that. Yes, unfortunately, I've had some cases where mom has passed away. So do you talk regularly to your, you have two daughters and a son? I do. And are they of age for you to have a conversation with them about what you're doing? They, they, yes. So the 19 year old has also been reading my, you know, the, as I was writing my book, I just kept giving it. I'm like, okay, Abby, this is this is written for you. You read it, and whatnot. But yeah, so Abby's 19, Eliana's 15, almost 16, and then I have my little Liam. He's nine. Hmm. He has a little while. <laughs> he does. Yeah. The girl, girls are old. The girls are older, but uh, actually, Abby. Uh, April 4th, she'll be 20. Oh, my goodness. Well, congratulations. Yeah. So Thank do you. you have another book in you? Or has that I, not come up yet? In your... <laughs> I do. This book <laughs> is solely um, on childbirth. So it's a parent's guide to a safer childbirth. And I do have a lot of information also regarding pregnancy. So the next book is Pregnancy. And a lot of that is written. Hopefully I can, again, it's going to be good information from a completely different perspective. So hopefully I can get that out also to expecting parents. Gina Mundy, thank you so much for joining us. And again, the title of a book, A Parent's Guide to a Safer Childbirth, Expecting the Best, Using the Power of Knowledge to Help You Deliver a Healthy Baby. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you, Jackie, for having me. What a great conversation today. I really appreciate you uh, doing this episode with me. And say hi to your mom. <laughs> I will. Thank you. I'm sure she says hi, too. She'll be the first one to listen, <laughs> just so you know. We've already been texting today. She is so excited. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. We'll be back next week with another episode of Should I Listen to My Mother? 